Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 36th edition of Data Bytes, getting things done with data and government, supported tonight by Palantir. I'm Gavin Freegard, Associate at the Institute for Government, and it's wonderful to welcome so many of you this evening here at the IFG and online. Let's start in the usual way. Hands up if you've been to Data Bytes before. Welcome back. Hands up if this is your first Data Bytes. Welcome. So December data bytes, it's the most wonderful time of the year for those of you seeking some data-based geeking and data viz cheer. Though that does mean, sadly, it's the final data bytes of this year. He's not really upset about that. He's just discovered England's first two knockout matches are on ITV. We will, of course, be back in the new year. Now, I've had a busy few weeks, so I thought I'd use ChatGPT, the new AI language model everyone's tweeting about, to automate some of my introduction this evening. So I asked it how it would introduce the event, and I have to say, I think that's pretty good. Uh, I then asked it how it would fill an eight-minute speaking slot. I don't think our speakers tonight have anything to worry about, but again, it's not too bad. And then I asked it if it had any jokes about data. Now, speaking from experience, if you're having to explain the joke, it's probably not a very good one. And to be honest, this one's less a joke and more reality. But however bad those jokes might be, just think, it could have been a lot worse. Shall we? <laughs> uh, let's instead start with the usual housekeeping. Tonight's event is on the record, and we are being live streamed, obviously. On social media, it's hashtag IFG Data Bytes, and we are live tweeting from at IFG Events. If you're here in the building, the Wi-Fi is IFG Internet Hotspot, password Institute123, all lowercase. And as ever, I'll be putting all of your questions to our speakers. If you're watching online, use the Slido page you're almost certainly already on. And if you're not, go to bit.ly slash slidodb36. If you're here at the IFG, you can, of course, raise your hand. Why does the IFG organise data bytes? Well, we aim to bring together the various different data communities in and around government to show everyone what better data can achieve in practice and to put interesting projects on the record so we can all learn from them. How does data bytes work? You're going to see four presentations about data this evening. Each presentation will last for eight minutes. Yes, just eight minutes, the average length of stoppage time at this year's World Cup. There are eight bits in a byte, hence eight minutes in a data byte. The presenter will then face questions for eight minutes. Yes, just eight minutes. And then we'll move on to the next presentation. So four presentations of eight minutes, each followed by questions for eight minutes. This is our 36th data bytes. You can watch the previous 35 on the IFG website. So what's happened since we last met? Well, it says a lot about British politics that it's felt like a relatively quiet month. Even though we've had one ministerial resignation and maybe more to come, the perma-poly crisis or poly-perma crisis continues. We've had the first of several imminent by-elections and the latest dramatic loss of the whip. Maybe it's the World Cup. Maybe it's just not been as mad as the rest of the year. Or maybe it's just that nobody's on Twitter to talk about it anymore. Let's start with that resignation, Gavin Williamson. Now, as regular attendees will know, it's never a good sign for British politics when an IFG chart has to be time-stamped. It's even worse when we have to zoom in on the detail. After that, we had the Chester by-election, with a couple more to come in the next few weeks and months. Uh, these are all of the by-elections uh, to the House of Commons since 1979. If we just look at the ones that have changed hands, uh, we can see that there have actually been a lot that have changed hands this parliament down at the bottom, including only the third government gain since 1979, Labour's first gain since 2012, and some thumping wins for the Lib Dems from the government as well. Now, one indicator of the recent craziness of British politics is the number of changes of allegiance by MPs, defections, starting new parties, or having the whip suspended. We had a lot of all of those in the previous parliament, and we've had a fair few of them this time already as well. This parliament sits fourth of all parliaments since the Second World War in terms of those changes of allegiance. Now, that's understandably got too much for several MPs who have already announced they're standing down at the next election. When I put this together this morning, there were 24 of them in that camp. But a few hours ago, they were joined by a new campmate author, reality TV star, jockey, parkour enthusiast, and occasional parliamentarian, Matt Hancock. 
Now, there's still a bit of a way to go before we match the numbers who stepped down in 2019, and even further before we match either 2015 or, 2020, or 2010. Now, one MP apparently not standing down is Boris Johnson, who this week addressed a blockchain conference in the middle of a generally difficult period for crypto a phenomenon many people simply don't understand the popularity of, and associated with all sorts of shady characters and spicy rumours, Boris Johnson was previously Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. And speaking of contro controversy, political and financial, yes, it's the Men's Football World Cup being held in Qatar. Now, Qatar is by some distance, or more accurately by some area, the smallest nation ever to host the event. Here it is, compared to other recent hosts. You could fit 1.6 million football pitches inside Qatar. 2018 host Russia could take 2.4 billion of them. Or to use the international standard unit of country size, Qatar is just over half of Wales, <laughs> while Russia is more than 822 of them. Speaking of Wales, I was delighted that we reached the finals for the first time since 1958. Here are some of our highlights. <laughs> More seriously, as a Welshman, I'm really proud of the team qualifying for the World Cup and then deciding to boycott it by crashing out at the first opportunity. England, of course, faced France in the quarterfinals under the management of Gareth Southgate. Now, each segment here is an England knockout match in a major tournament. Gareth Southgate has been involved in 42% of them as a player or a manager. His record is even more impressive than that, though. Southgate has been involved in 63% of all England's knockout victories since 1966. Remarkably, there is at least one manager still in the tournament with a better record, taking part in 71% of their nation's knockout wins. That would be Didier Deschamps, the manager of France. Take solace in the fact that statistic doesn't really mean anything, unlike this one. <laughs> Turning to tonight's event, which is themed around levelling up and local government, our first speaker, who will be virtual, is Liz Zeidler of the Centre for Thriving Places on data for a well-being economy. Then we'll hear from Tom Smith at DLUC on data for levelling up. After that comes Ishra Kateza from tonight's sponsor, Palantir Technologies, on the use of data in the Homes for Ukraine scheme. And we'll end with Chris Pope, joining us virtually from the Greater Manchester Combined Authority on data for local areas. Now, the next scheduled data bytes is on Thursday, the 2nd of February, before we revert to our usual slot on the first Wednesday of the month. But do keep an eye on the IFG website and sign up to our newsletter and events emails, as we might just squeeze in a few extra ones as well. A huge thank you to Palantir for supporting tonight's event. As regular attendees will know, we need sponsors to keep Databytes going. So if you'd like to sponsor a future Databytes, please get in touch with my colleague, Pratesh. And if you're in government and would like to present or know someone who should, please get in touch with me. That's more than enough from me to get started. We'll now go to our first speaker this evening, and that's going to be Liz joining us virtually. And I see her slides are already on screen. Good evening, Liz. Hi, everybody. So good, great to meet you. What a fantastic quick summary you gave us there. I think I'm going to uh, try and uh, struggle to live up to that. Um, anyway, I thought I'd tell you a little tiny bit about the organisation that I'm, I'm a co-founder of. Um, Centre for Thriving Places has been going for about 13 years. We're a charity and a not-for-profit. Um, and in many ways, we've been at the vanguard of a movement supporting the growth of what is increasingly being called a well-being economy, which I'll tell you more about in a moment. Um, we support local places across the UK and in many cases beyond to deliver a growth in our capacity to thrive. There's a clue in the name there. Uh, we do that through a combination of data, research, tools and also consultancy support for places to really embed this new way of working. And I'm going to tell you a bit about that and that the role that data plays in making that kind of shift happen across the economy. I'm going to start with a quote. Is that moved? No, no. Hang on, there we go. Uh, I'm going to start with a quote, uh, and in many ways I feel like this group hardly needs to be reminded of this, but it's an important context, I think. If we, um, Joseph Stiglitz, the head of the world, the 
um, economic head of the World Bank said, if we measure the wrong things, we strive for the wrong things. And our work and the things I'm going to share today aren't just about have we got good enough data on people's mental health and well-being? And if we, if we have got the right data, what fun stuff can we do about it? This is about much, much more than that. In many ways, it's about what it, what's it all for? What is all of the activity of the government, of the economy, the state, business and communities for? And our answer, and that of an increasing number of people, would be that it's all there to grow the well-being of people and planet in one shape or another. And it's vital that we're clear on what matters for that um, end goal so that we can strive to grow it. Um, Joe Biden recently said, don't tell me about your values, show me your budget and I'll tell you what you value. And I think, to be honest with you, he's got a point. So our work is about embedding what really matters to people and to the planet at the heart of what we measure and therefore what we strive for. Um, I've been asked to share a bit more about one of our kind of primary tools, which is called the Thriving Places Index. Um, uh, and this is the kind of headline structure of that index. And at that very headline level, it aims to answer three interconnected questions. Are we creating the right local conditions for people to thrive? Are we doing that equitably so everybody can thrive? And are we doing it sustainably so future generations can also thrive? And beneath those really powerful cross-party, cross-sector kind of questions lie a lot of familiar areas of work for local and national governments that you'll see here on the screen. But it brings them together to show how these are not silos of disconnected programmes of work, but a web of factors that together drive our capacity to thrive, or frankly not to thrive in some cases. Um, and beneath those familiar headlines lies the nitty gritty, the important stuff, the complexity that's required, if you like, for really grown up governing and for system change. And of course, the economy is there, but uh, but we are looking at what sort of economy grows our capacity to thrive equitably and sustainably. So, for example, we have a good jobs indicator in there, not just jobs, so the quality of them and the security and the pay. We have the percentage of local businesses, not just um, uh, global mega corporations. We also look at less obvious things like community cohesion, participation, the quality of housing, the local environment, access to green space, access to services, and so much more. So many different factors that influence our well-being both individually and collectively. But importantly, a framework like this really helps everyone in a place to see their part in good placemaking, from the smallest community group right through to regional mayors and national government bodies. Everyone can see what levers they can move for a better place, and then everyone can see the ripple effect that their work has on the system, and they'll find their little place in that, in that whole body of change. And of course, you know, hence why I'm here, behind all of that lies a lot of data, over 60 indicators from different highly reputable sources that are gathered, checked, triple checked and brought together to support this much more joined up decision making. We publish the results every year um, for every local authority in England and Wales. I think that's just over 370 at the moment with maps and graphs and scorecards to help show what's working, what needs more support, what strengths are there. And there are strengths in every single place that we show the data for and where things can be learned about what works for a better place. Um, this data, you know, you can play with it and you're the data guys, you can play with it in all sorts of different ways, but it's increasingly being used by academics and public bodies such as the ONS and many others to make sense of many things. You know, why did some areas cope better through COVID? What needs levelling up beyond those just simplistic measures like productivity and GDP? And what can we learn about what works to do that? Um, you know, recently to coincide with COP27, we were looking at what are the connections between areas that do well, both economically and on these local conditions um, data factors for thriving, um, and the, their climate impact and mitigation, and found some really similar patterns that they found and um, were some of the big talking points at COP about how we look at those, how we support the less economically um, uh, developed places to really um, move into a sustainable future. Um, but it's really important that this is much more than just an annual league table. Just as we said at the beginning, you know, what we what we measure is what we strive for. So this can be used and is being used as a shared goal and a compass for decision making. It really helps joined up policy and action on all of those big, big challenges that we're facing that need that kind of collective work. It's asset based. It's, a, it's an amazing evaluation framework for interventions, large and small. It's an engagement tool and, of course, a load of data for interdisciplinary research. It, it, it's a really amazing way of bringing together sectors, departments, disciplines to tackle those very complex challenges that we're facing. 
Um, I also wanted to mention that we that this stuff is available at lots of different geographies and levels. We publish the data at the local authority level, both upper and lower tier, but we've done lots of work about adapting this kind of approach and this sort of data um, picture for towns, for rural areas, a big report there we did for DEFRA, for cities, for specific projects and for particular interventions. We help adapt it and create bespoke versions of it with the right data for the needs and priorities of community groups for, you know, individual Individual places. We're currently working with combined authorities, um, public health, some uh, individual local authorities and some different sector bodies to really start embedding this kind of let's measure what matters so that we can really strive to deliver that. And I also wanted to mention not just that we can go lower, but also that this is a huge movement that's really gathering pace around the world. Using wellbeing data um, is, is, a, is a space that's really coming of age. More places are making this a really fundamental shift. You know, you've got New Zealand, who's, whose whole budget is based on the impact any in investment has on the wellbeing of people and planet. You've got Wales and Scotland closer to home with Wales' Future Generations Act and, and Scotland's um, National Performance Framework, which are really, really starting to focus on how our policy and action delivering in terms of shifting the, this data. Their argument is increasingly being won around the world. The OECD, UN, I've put a few of them up here. And just right now, we're currently finishing a paper on how these different models and more of them share essentially the same ingredients. The same data lies behind them. And the evidence is clear about what drives well-being. We just need to use that evidence and use that data to ensure we're really measuring the right things, as I said at the beginning, so we strive for the right things for now and for generations to come and then I think that's about eight minutes and uh, those are some um, websites that you can go and get loads more information um, and I'm happy to take any more detailed questions because that was very much an overview uh, in the Q&A. Well Liz thank you very much indeed. <laughs> now while we get Liz up on the screen for questions and there you are great to see you Liz. Um, Hi. For those of you watching us online that if you're not already on the Slido, go to bit.ly slash slidodb36 and put your questions there. Some people already are. Um, I'm going to come to the room first uh, for the first question. Please do wait for the roving mic. Uh, do tell us who you are if you can. Do keep it short because we are up against the clock. Um, and yes, remember we are on the record. So who would like to ask a first question of Liz? Go on. I should, flag, I should flag that I'm not actually the data guru in Centre for Thriving Places. I'm a co-founder and the chief exec. Should have said that right at the beginning, shouldn't I? But I'll do my best. Uh, thanks. Matt Davis from the Open Data Institute. Um, I'm just curious Hi. if you've got any uh, examples you particularly like about how the index has been used to inform policies or strategies. Oh, there are lots of them. Um, I'll, I'll go big and small. So um, at... Uh, a, at the moment, we've just been working with the North of Tyne Combined Authority, who we've developed a sort of bespoke version of the of the index I've just described to, to create a well-being framework. And they're right at the moment, it's been approved by the whole of Cabinet, etc. And they're they're starting to really embed that into how all of their decisions are being made. You know, what kind of policy is going to drive this kind of um, data? What kind of investments? What kind of budget decisions, etc. And I think that's when it gets really powerful. Is when you start thinking like that. You start thinking, okay, what's the purpose of all of this is to shift this this kind of data and if, if that is the end goal of policy and action across government then you make very different decisions than if the end goal is merely to grow GDP or GVA or the other kind of slightly more traditional economic models if you like that's a big scale one we're also doing some really interesting work um, at a sort of smaller scale where some of those kind of community organizations that work right across a place and are having an amazing impact but aren't necessarily understanding what that impact is in a collective way, but also the sort of social value and what impact that then has on the economic. So one of the exciting things about supporting them to use this sort of shared set of indicators, and that's how they're using it, um, uh, is that they're gathering data to help demonstrate what does work, what doesn't work in some cases, and also what kind of ripple effect that then has out there. So they're not just, you know, counting bums on seats, if you like, for, you know, drug rehabilitation, but they're actually looking at what impact that's then having on employment, on, on education, on crime and you know all sorts of other things so it's a kind of it really starts making things much more joined up and kind of you know savvy really so we can speed up the process of change 
Excellent, thanks. We've got a question from Anonymous online. Good evening to you, Anonymous. Um, and I think you, you started to answer this, actually, just as the question came in, which is, have you used more granular geographies, so for instance, LSOAs and MSOAs, to drill down into the index? Yeah, so we have a bit, but also we try to make this all as open as, you know, we're passionate about this mission, so it's all very open and accessible. So all the methodology, all the kind of clever stuff that the cleverer people than me in my organisation do is all online and really openly available. And in all of the lists of indicators and everything, we say which ones are already available at LSOA level, because one of the things you find, the more local you get um, in terms of granularity, the, you know, the less capacity there is, let's be honest, for people to be doing lots and lots of extra new data gathering. So we try and make it as easy as possible because it's a big shift for people to try and make it easy as possible. And that, um, I flashed it up on the screen, but I'm happy to share links afterwards. We we did a report um, about how to use the framework as a kind of set of indicators at a town or a village or a community level. To, so, so you can still use the thinking and the, the, the indicators that are there to create a really bespoke thing for as small a geography as you want. And it's also increasingly being used as an evaluation tool. So literally a single project can pick out some of the indicators they think they're going to be influencing and start tracking that and looking at that um, compared to their local area. Great, thanks. Let's come back into the room for the next question. Hands up if you'd like to ask it. Over there. Uh, good evening, Simon, Simon Briscoe. Um, I, really a question about the data. I don't know how many bits of data you put in there, but that sort of Stiglitz quote always sort of haunts me because I wonder that a lot of the, what you might call hard data that you've got on say crime rates or medical treatments that you were talking about are riddled with all sorts of flaws that we know. And then if you go and ask people how they feel or what they're struggling from, well, that's just a load of feelings and these can all change rapidly for many reasons other than actual things in the world. So I just wonder whether you're left with hundreds of bits of data that you would love someone, the government or someone else to collect to, to make the whole project that much more valuable. Um, so the art, so there's lots of different questions in there and lots of different answers. So um, is it all perfect data? 100% not. I'm sure everybody in this room knows that there isn't such a thing as perfect data. We have worked incredibly hard over 13 years with all sorts of experts, but also policy people and people in communities. And we've done so much work to try and make it reflective of what really matters to people and get the best available indicators for that. And then we're incredibly rig rigorous. We're this year we partnered with the University of Birmingham um, to gather the data and they were shocked at how, quite how how rigorous we are. We're apparently much, much more rigorous than normal academic processes. So we're very careful that we don't have kind of bad data or, or poorly, you know, some people have said, oh, we can we measure this, but actually the, the survey that's using that hasn't got big enough sample sizes, all the kind of classic stuff. So we've, we've got quite a high bar, but that does mean things, some things just aren't being measured that well. And, and certainly the geographies we're talking about. So yes, um, there are gaps in there in terms of what we'd love to be in there. It's as good as we can make it. We improve it every year. But we also have really good relationships with a lot of those data um, gathering bodies, you know, ONS and many others. And we have, you know, quite robust conversations with them about why on earth aren't you measuring this? It's incredibly important to every community we ever go into and work with, but it's not it's not being measured out there. And that's a huge gap. So it's a it's a it's a balancing act between not waiting for perfect before we get going, but um, and helping people to use it as a way of thinking as well as, as using the data, um, but also really pushing for this stuff to be taken much, much more seriously and therefore um, tracked and measured better than it is. So that's a bit of a mixed yes and no answer. Sorry, not to be more specific. Brilliant, thank you. Uh, let's stay in the room for the next question. I've got another one at the back. Yes, Hartley Miller. Um, to what extent do you actually track the interactions of the data streams, the variables as it were, because there must be several which, um, where one thing is um, focused upon, it has a possibly negative effect on one of the others? Yeah, again, there's not a simple answer to that one. Um, uh, we, we're a really small charity, so we only have a really limited amount of time or capacity or resources to do loads and loads of interesting data analysis on this. But um, we're... 
we're increasingly getting interest both from government bodies but also from academics because it's an incredible well we've been gathering it for a long time now we, there's an amazing wealth of data there um, and some of the things that they're pulling out is really really interesting and as I mentioned we did this you know just quite a small you know blog type paper recently um, around COP27 and that was really interesting looking at you know those patterns that they were arguing about at COP27 about you know the rich countries produce the pollution but they can also afford to mitigate against it and have those sorts of policies and exactly the same things happening in the UK and when we start looking at those kind of those complexities of of, of you know simply you know, we're talking a, a lot today about leveling up it's really easy to see some of those simplistic north-south divides but actually when you get under the surface there's some fascinating places that are bucking those trends so what's happening in those places etc so it because there's such a wealth of data I think there's six it varies each year but I think it's about 67 indicators this year over 370 local authorities it's quite a lot of information and as you say there's so it's a nuance about how those ripple effects it is a system so each thing does affect other things so we always have to take that local piece into account but um yeah it's there's so much that can be learned from this data and we'd be delighted to hear from anyone who'd like to work with us to dig around more and, and use it much more proactively thanks we've got time for one more quick question hands up i'll stay in the room otherwise i'll ask one and nobody wants that Nope. Um, so a question from, from me, Les, which is um, sort of a classic question on these sort of data projects. What does success look like for you and for the index and for the, for the centre? So, so success for me is less about the success for us, but more success in, in, the, in the wider world. I think success looks like we start as a society recognising that if we, if we are focused all of our energies on delivering really simplistic things like growing our consumption and production and the things that GDP measure, um, uh, that's not the end goal. It is potentially an important means to different end goals, but it's not the end goal. So, so the wellbeing economy movement overall is saying, let's put the things that really, really support us to thrive in that complex way right at the heart of our decision making. So for me, the end goal is this sort of data, whether it's ours or others, I'm not particular, I'm not here to market. We, you know, we're, we're here to deliver a mission. And it is this sort of data that should be driving decisions right across local and national government. And that, for me, is success. Fantastic. Well, thank you for getting us off to a very successful start this evening, Liz. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry, I have to dash. <laughs> Uh, and we're now back in the room for our next speaker, and that's going to be Tom. Great, thanks, Gavin. Can you hear me OK at the back and online? Fantastic. And uh, how are the slides looking? Great. Why well, those coming up? So I'm Tom Smith from the, um, the Department for Leveling Up. I'm going to talk about leveling up and data and why I think we are in a position where data is one of the critical success factors for how we make policy, how we support services and so on. I'm going to talk about some of the examples from DLUC, from Leveling Up Department, but also other departments and wider across government. And coming back to kind of Liz's point about why this matters, this is about supporting d delivery of services locally across the UK, but it is also about understanding and evaluating what works and things like that. So I'll start off very kind of quickly about our, our creation myth. So I run the spatial data unit at the Department for Leveling Up. We're a commitment in the white paper, which came up in February this year. Um, and government here committed to, 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 to supporting both how the department uses data, that's one part, also how government uses data, that's bigger, but also how we um, use that to drive and support work across the UK. So lots of kind of grand commitments in there. And I'm going to try and unpick some of the bits of that um, and look forward to questions. Um, so why does it matter? Let's start with some data and a chart. Um, each of the vertical lanes here is a, a region. And levelling up, you can argue for a, a long time about what it means, and I'm, I'm not here for that one. What I am here for is talent is equally spread, but opportunity is not. And if you look in the regions across the UK and how many children are living in low-income households, then at local authority level, you have enormous variance. So if you're starting to think about the north is like such and such, or the southwest is like such and such, you're really being very crude, because at local authority level, you have huge variation in those areas. And if you go further, if you start digging down into, say, street level, 
and again, this is all public data, and this one here is from the, the indices of multiple deprivation, you have huge variation in the proportion to people living in income um, deprivation or out of work and so on. And again, in, in urban areas, in rural areas, often you have real cheek by jowl differences. Now, that's not a surprise if you know these areas, but to be able to put up the data on this and talk about and show decision makers and say, this is the area we're talking about, these are the sorts of policies and services you're thinking about, this is how it plays into the decisions. That's the sort of air way or the, the moment where data can be hugely influential and hugely important. Um, it's not just local and spatial data. It's also about what's changing over time. So this is from the leveling up white paper. And it's looking at regions over the last 100 plus years and productivity differences. And at the top, you won't be surprised to see um, it's London at the moment in terms of high levels of productivity. That goes back a long time. So some of these issues and differences, even at regional level, are, are long-lived. So the sorts of solutions or challenges or things that we're trying to tackle and solve you know, really need kind of big solutions and, and, and big thinking that's across government, across industry and wider. It's not just trend data, though. It's also linked data, maybe at individual level, over, long, over time, so longitudinal data. So this is, again, from the white paper, but showed what the income is for children once they hit, when they're 10 years later after they've left school, so age 28, who were free, um, free school meals. So they were in low-income households, getting free school meals at school. 10 years later, what was their income doing? You need quite a lot of longitudinal information linked there. And so this comes out of something called the Longitudinal Educational Outcomes um, project and work led by DfE and others, which links together data across a huge range of outcomes. It's that sort of valuable piece that really sort of starts to unpick. And this, I think, is where you start kind of moving from showing the sorts of problems or challenges or things you're trying to improve, so the sorts of trends like this, the sorts of small area patterns like this, and you can start thinking about what might we do to resolve or support or solve some of these things. So again, longitudinal data like this means we can start thinking about, we ran these sorts of programs in these areas, or with this cohort of people, what happened? How did things work and improve? Or how did they maybe not? What was the impact of our programs? So this sort of data is inc incredibly valuable. Um, so I'm going to kind of, you know, that's the sort of background. What are we doing in terms of the department and the spatial data unit? And I think some of this kind of works department-wide, some of it works government-wide, and some of it starts thinking UK-wide. Um, our first thing is to say and to look at, we need robust data at local level that tells us and supports policy making, that supports service delivery both by national government and also by local areas. And big hook for Chris Pope's talk coming up in a moment. Um, one of the areas is where does government spend money? How do we invest? So if you're thinking about inputs, money landing at local area level, we don't have a very good set of measures for that, which is kind of surprising for me coming in from, from outside government and working in industry and academia before. But it's one of the areas that we're looking to improve and publish more data out. So what you've got here is a sort of set of splodges that talks about where the department is investing in particular programmes. But we're also looking at economic data, so we're working with ONS on supporting and providing, producing more data at local level. So GVA, to measure productivity, will be published at super output area level, so that's down to sort of neighbourhoods um, in the new year. Also, we're thinking about and looking at skills data and how to improve that. So lots of things around better data, and there's a lot of challenge there to produce what I think of as data as infrastructure, so making sure that we have good information at all levels, supporting services and policy. The second part of the story, if you've got better data, how do you insert that into decision making? And there's lots clearly involved here, and we'll hear some more examples shortly. But one of the things is getting data and analysis and insight into the room where the decisions are made. And that's one of the reasons that the, the data unit that I lead is in, is in the department. But bringing in, for example, working with local areas and saying, what do we know about connectivity and access? How would that be changed or affected with new bus routes, new train routes, and so on? What, about, what does that mean in terms of access to jobs? Thinking about energy efficiency in housing, how does that play out and link to cost of living, for example, and co uh, increases over time in energy costs? 
Think about things like the investment zones, which was a, a, a program which, which, which had a short, -lived, a short life, but really wanting to have support and um, data and analysis in the room to say, here is where you might put sorts of zones, here's the sorts of things that we might be looking for under this program. So that second bit is about supporting decision making. And then the third bit is about working with local areas. So there's often seen to be this divide between national and local. And levelling up, there should be absolutely no divide because it's clearly something that plays out spatially and locally. So the way we collaborate, the way we work together is a huge part of that. And so working on devolution deals with Greater Manchester, with West Midlands, with others, um, and, and how powers and responsibilities are supported and operated locally, thinking about the data that we need and to see impact and change over time in those areas, and coming to agreed conclusions on sort of what the big stories are, that all relies on good data at local level. So that's the kind of key part of it. So I'm going to finish up. I've got 20 seconds. Leveling up local growth, huge priorities for the government, huge priorities at national but also local level, whatever you call it, leveling up, everyone is interested in tackling spatial inequalities. Data insight and analysis, critical success factors, and being able to bring those things into the discussions with ministers, with teams creating policy, absolutely critical. So understanding what people need in order to support those decision making. And I'm going to stop there. Thank you, Gavin. Thank you, Tom. Uh, again, a reminder, if you're online, please do, do use the Slido to put your questions to Tom. Uh, and if you're not already on the Slido, it's bit.ly slash slidodb36. Um, but I will come to the room first again this time. Um, lots of ground covered there, uh, figuratively and literally. Um, who would like to ask the first question of Tom? And again, wait for the microphone. We've got one down here at the front. Hi, Sean Thomas, Department for International Trade. How do we join up the insight that you're getting with the work that we do on investment and export to make sure that overall the UK gets the best benefit from the combined effort? Hmm. Great question. I think that's just about cross-government department, department of working and uh, ignoring or getting round or crashing through department silos. Hmm. So me maybe come back to my kind of two themes. The first is about better data. So ensuring that we're able to share and reuse data. Um, I would love to have access to information that DIT has in terms of local exports, imports, in terms of the discussions, in terms of the intelligence that you know you have on local areas. That would be a really useful addition to the sorts of things we have. I know we've discussed this as well. Um, so that sharing of data, first up. Secondly, thinking about the decisions that are going on and being made at the set, you know, and, and, and being able to inform those. So the usual thing, a range of kind of cross-government discussion forums saying, here's the sort of thing my ministers or teams are looking at. What, how can you help? How can I get more input from your side? So those sorts of things, um, lots, lots there. Um, we're on a journey. Oh, I tried not to say that, but it's an important kind of working together piece. Brilliant, thanks. Um, we've got a question at the back, I think. Thank you very much for talking about working um, across departments, etc. cetera. Um, when you put up the maps and I looked at the general readings, I mean, nothing's really new, is it, um, regarding the regions? And that's where I talk about uh, intersectionality um, of experiences. And most departments tend to have people of the same um, background, etc. Whereas we, are ha we have a world that is rapidly um, changing in terms of soft power. And uh, the lady talked about imports and exports. If you don't have intersectionality of experiences, how then do you come on with sound policy? And I'm speaking as a macroeconomist. And also the confounding factors. Data is good. But you, if you don't understand the confounding factors that are affecting the data, as we found in COVID, um, what happens is that you come up with a policy which is not really working in, in the real world. So how are we, uh, I say someone who's British born, um, how are we going to 
realize that what we need is cultural change to prevent the silos you're talking about and then to connect the silos so that we can understand the nuances that the data uh, presents and how that impacts confounding factors. Thank you very much. Yeah, Got great, great questions and lots in there. Um, maybe a couple of things. So I, I joined public sector to, to, to join the Office of National Statistics and set up something called the Data, the, the data Science Campus there. And one of the things we really know strongly in data science is if you have a very um, you know, white middle class ma men like me running the team, you're going to have algorithms that don't respond to the real world. So getting diversity into your teams is super important. So we, we started out with that. I think we had a third civil service, a third industry, a third academia come in. That's one measure of diversity of thought. There are lots of others. Um, in the department now, Department for Leveling Up, I, one of our HQs is in Wolverhampton, um, which was opened, I think, this year, maybe last year. Um, but one of the kind of big pushes for government is to get more civil servants, public sector workers, outside Whitehall. That's brilliant. Totally support that. And it sort of talks to the sorts of things you've just kind of covered. So I think lots, lots of stuff there that we can and should be doing, and lots more. Great, thank you. Um, I'll go online for a question now from Anonymous. Uh, for longitudinal analysis, how do you cope with changes in and the often shared geographies of central and devolved government funds and projects in terms of reporting and visualisation? Ah, wow. Um, ideally, you have data at very macro, micro level. So if, for example, your longitudinal data is on people, then how administrative boundaries are changing around them doesn't matter too much. And you can then cut it and report back up to the different boundaries. Um, if your data is based on boundaries, there are a lot of people in the room who spend a lot of time looking at that. So there are methods. It's never ideal. So. Great, thanks. Um, another one from online from my colleague at the IFG, Paul Shepley. Um, data collection requires effort over time. Is the data unit equipped to generate and inform the collection of data it wants, especially the longitudinal type studies referred to in your presentation? Yes. So I think that's a, it's a good question. I think this is a, a government-wide question. So the spatial data unit is not set up to be the sole collector of data. Um, it would be a lot, lot bigger if it was. So there are lots of groups already working in the space. So the Office of National Statistics is a huge one. Um, we, we have a program with ONS which is improving the statistics that they publish, particularly at local level, filling in some of the gaps that we know for levelling up are important. Um, there's an ONS local program that's putting statisticians in every region and um, the countries of the UK. Um, but then working with other groups across government like Sean, and DIT and, and Trade and others. Um, so the data unit is one part of that. We have a role to or remit to improve the data for levelling up. Some of that we might produce. Lots of it's about commissioning others, banging the drum and so on. Great, thanks. Um, we've got, I'll take the question at the... I'll take, yeah, the questions from the back. So yes, you first, and then we'll come to the next one. Uh, Kate Mulvaney, Cornwall Insight. Um, has the energy crisis affected the prioritisation of energy-related data uh, um, and the demand for that data, or, um, or, or are things very similar to as they were before? I think it is, we've had been talking about energy data in lots of ways across every team I've been in in government for a long time, does it become more immediately relevant to what policymakers or ministers are talking about? Absolutely yes. Um, so sometimes things that you want to do, um, you can get, you, you get a great interest from senior people which help you do things that were perhaps harder this time last year. Um, so yes, it's really useful information to understand how uh, cost of living issues are playing out locally and playing out for different groups. Um, Certainly, if we're thinking about kind of insulation, about energy property kind of ratings and certificates, which is something the department run, that's really interesting to us. And then how that plays out and links to energy use, absolutely yes. So short answer is yes. Great. And let's say the final question from next to you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Matt Carlock. Um, but, uh, sort of bluntly, what, what, what's going to be different and what's new this time? Because like you say, there's a, there's a long run regional inequality in this country that's existed for a century and more. Um, we've also had for, for several decades now, we've had local deprivation data, we've got other sort of local level data. So what's, what's new, what's different, what's going to make the difference this time? 
Yes. <clears throat> I think making the data available and accessible that you can't necessarily publish. So longitudinal data as sorts of things we've just been talking about. That is, in my mind, a really, whether it's a game changer or a really powerful um, re ingredient to improving your services, that's a big, big impact. Um, the other one is devolution. So levelling up and the white paper covers a range of devolution discussions with other parts of the UK. So we know that, for example, there's published analysis of impact on public health, from health being devolved in some ways to Greater Manchester. So those sorts of things, I think, are a big difference. It's, so it's not just about pots of money being kind of allocated to different areas. It is very big scale changes. Well, Tom, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you. And uh, sorry to those of you online whose questions I didn't get to. Lots of questions uh, flowing in there. Um, we now move on to our next speaker, and that's Ishraq. Hello. Can everybody hear me OK? Brilliant. OK. All right. Hi, my name is Ishraq, and I'm a deployment strategist at Palantir Technologies. Tonight, I'll be sharing some of our recent work with the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities, or DLUC. So millions of people have been forced to flee their homes since Russia's invasion of Ukraine in one of Europe's largest humanitarian catastrophes since the Second World War. In response, governments and communities have opened their doors to the millions displaced by the conflict. Here in the UK, local authorities, DLUC and the Home Office have come together to create a scheme that provides a route to safety for refugees from Ukraine. That scheme is called Homes for Ukraine, and the Homes for Ukraine data platform is built on top of our software, Palantir Foundry. I'm here today to talk about some of the data and technology that helped get refugees safely accommodated and resettled to the UK. Specifically, I'll be covering three main areas. First, the technology that supports central and local government to collaborate in delivering Homes for Ukraine. Then, how that collaboration supported a unique approach to entity resolution and improved data quality. And finally, a reflection on some of the achievements of this scheme. First, some context on the scheme. So Homes for Ukraine is a first of its kind resettlement program in the UK. It's uncapped in the number of people that it can help and operating at a pace that aims to match the urgency of the situation. Oop. Give me a second. There we go. It runs on the generosity of the public, encouraging people to host refugees in their homes. When the scheme went live in March, the public, went, the public did their part and responded overwhelmingly, with over 120,000 offers of accommodation in just 24 hours. But the scale of the data challenge became clear almost immediately. With tens of thousands of visa applications, sat across different systems that needed to be securely and quickly shared across each and every part of the UK. But it took just nine days for DLUC to configure Foundry to solve these data problems and launch the Homes for Ukraine data platform. To achieve this, we followed a playbook tested at Palantir for nearly 20 years. On Foundry, data is represented in an ontology Ontology is a framework and collection of technologies on Foundry that users can build on top of. It combines their data, operations, and analytics in one interoperable platform. There are three key technologies within the ontology that address the problems that were faced. First, how do you gather all the information caseworkers may need across a complex data landscape? Using objects in the ontology, Central government can integrate everything they know about a certain entity on one place. And objects translate this data into an accessible format. So instead of dealing with a myriad of visa applications, users deal with relatable objects, like a guest that's staying with a host at a particular accommodation. And the second challenge is to ensure that access to that information doesn't compromise on the security or governance of that data. This is especially important here, as the scheme requires sharing PII to local authorities across the country. By using Foundry's permission-based access controls, DLUC were able to enforce various data governance structures, 
meaning caseworkers could only see a subset of information granted to them for a specific purpose and for a set amount of time. And finally, how do you make sure that data isn't out of date immediately after it's shared? How do you mitigate against disruptions to ways of working across hundreds of different organizations but still capture decision making? First, all users from central or local government work with the same objects. This means when caseworkers flag a safeguarding concern, they have the confidence that a downstream decision maker will know and react quickly. But also key to this is interoperability. That's why changes to data on Foundry are made through action APIs, which can be run from within or outside of the platform. This means that data can be updated from existing technologies that local authorities have and reduce disruption to their existing ways of working. But for local authorities without ex existing infrastructure, Foundry provides secure in-platform applications, reducing the dependency and security risks associated with working on offline spreadsheets, especially when they hold PII. And today we see over 700 caseworkers across over two thirds of all local authorities using the in-platform caseworking applications every single day. But as the situation in Ukraine developed, the data landscape got more complex. People started submitting multiple applications, causing duplication in the data. And it became much more difficult to know which applications belonged to which person. To take a simple example, imagine on one application, an applicant's name is entered as Robert, and another application, it's entered as Bob. The process of working out that these two applications are actually referring to the same person is called entity resolution. But how do you responsibly balance automation, the code that performs entity resolution, with human decision making, the context on the ground that knows which records are actually duplicates? Historically, entity resolution is performed by deploying models, choosing a confidence threshold, and then after that, combining those records, often with very little feedback from the data consumers. But by using the ontology, central government data engineers are able to deploy models that first share suggested duplicates to users. This helps users find case details that may be spread across duplicates and potentially find key information that otherwise may have been missed. But once local authority users confirm that a suggestion is a true duplicate, they implicitly give data engineers feedback on how well each model is doing. Then data engineers can improve their initial model, meaning in the future, the duplication is automatically caught. And as all users are working on a common data asset, any improvement to data quality is implicitly shared across local and central government. And any improvement to data quality that's made centrally saves the effort of hundreds of local authorities each having to try and solve it locally. This means local authorities across the country can spend more time and resources to support refugees from Ukraine rather than each trying to individually make sense of their data. Taking a step back, by leveraging data, operations, and analytics, DLUC can now see how policies are playing out in the field. For example, how many people are being hosted? Which areas may need more support? It allows central government to proactively support local authorities and improve their access to technology. And in a period of tightening budgets, this means that you can avoid replicating work hundreds of times over by providing good interoperable tooling. And finally, I'll close with the impact of this scheme. Homes to Ukraine has helped over 100,000 people successfully arrive to the UK in under nine months. For comparison, the previous largest resettlement scheme brought in 20,000 people over five years. Homes to Ukraine is a testament to what's made possible when policy ideas aren't inhibited by technical limitation and when political and public will come together to enact policies that change lives. Thank you. Uh, a reminder for those of you watching us online, uh, put your questions through Slido, which is bit.ly slash slidodb36 if you're not there already. Uh, let's start in the room again. Who'd like to ask the first question of Ishrak? Got a question down here at the front. 
uh, Mark Williams, Energy UK. I was interested in what you were saying about the implicit feedback from service users to, to data engineers. Is there anything in um, the Planetary system or do you have any thoughts more generally about how that process can be made more common and more smooth because that feels like a very important part of mm. getting away from sort of quite siloed thinking that leads to the sort of you know, the system can't do it, computer says no type situations. I think you've hit the exact correct notes there. It's about the collaboration aspect, right? It's the fact that when a decision is made, often in silos, when a decision is made, the data for someone reporting it is immediately out of date. And in the Panther system, we try to leverage operations and analytics in the same place. So if you have like platforms which are performing your operations, you can still write back to the actual data where analytics is happening at the same time. And by that way, you kind of reconcile that disruption to ways of working, but also get the information that you need to understand the situation on the ground. Thanks. Uh, let's take another one in the room. Anyone? I've got a few coming in online as well. So let's go to one of the online ones. Um, this is from Sam at Med Confidential. Good evening to you, Sam. Um, I'll read this one verbatim. Um, Palantir's playbook is to suck in all data it can get, meaning customers can use only what Foundry has sucked. Would it not be better to deploy a Foundry that doesn't suck? No. <laughs> um, so I think there's a few things there. Like one of the common misconceptions about Palantir is the fact that we're a data company, but our business model is a software business. We give people, governments, corporations, companies, we give them the tools to make best use of their data. We use their data, we don't suck any data into Foundry. That's not part of our business model, that's not what we're about. We're a software company that helps institutions leverage their data in the best possible way. We're not a data gathering or data hoarding company. We don't monetize data from our customers. It's about helping them use their data in the best possible way. Great, thank you. Um, we've got an anonymous question online who says, impressive that the entity resolution solution could be developed so quickly for the Homes for Ukraine scheme, but do you see wider applications for this work in other areas of government? Yeah, I think that the model of having, um, so the entity resolution work I think is really powerful because of the fact that the people on the ground, the folks who are actually know like when a duplication is a match to a real person, is in the same place where these models are being run. And I think that collaboration between the end user and analytics needs to really be tied up together. Like AI, data science, all of these complex tools, they have to do something on the ground. And then when they do something on the ground, they have to help somebody. And I think that aspect of, data, of advanced analytics to help people is often overlooked. Um, and so hopefully government will take more of an approach there, but I'm just a tech person. <laughs> <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let's come back to the room for the next question. Who would like to ask it? We've got one there. Uh, Simon Briscoe. I just wondered if you could say something about updating the data and you know, whether there's carrot or stick for people to keep the data up to date. And I just wonder how many people who you think came into the country have somehow been lost. Mm, okay, so I think two questions. There. The first one about the carrot and stick method. I think that the, the visibility that local authorities get, you know, this, what this platform's really enabled is that collaboration. Like I, as a local authority person, can let central government know directly what's happening on the ground. And so I don't think there's a necessity for stick when you're just giving visibility. And I think visibility is something that's really important. Um, on the second part, like as with every novel scheme and every data platform that comes around, you know, there's accuracies, but because of the data model on Foundry, the way that this works is that all the raw data is always connected back to the objects that it creates. So to, you can always go back to the source, you can always see the lineage of where information has come from, and this helps users to, you know, hopefully not lose anybody in the cracks, but yeah. Um, I think this, this sort of follows on quite nicely from that. Another anonymous question online. Are there feedback loops in existence that help local authorities or data creators avoid creating more data errors? What are your thoughts on how important data literacy and system design are in this process? Massively. Um, I think that one of the difficulties, right, is when rolling out a platform as ambitious as this with that much scale, it's to take users on the journey with you. 
Um, so one of the things that we've been very proactive about is very regular trainings with local authorities. We've gone on site to almost every part of the UK, well not every almost part, but we've been going to parts of the UK, working with users on the ground and really hearing what they want from the data, what they're creating and how their operations work. And that kind of feeds back to what you're building. And I think that connection is super important. Thanks. Uh, let's come back into the room for the next question. Thanks, really interesting. I had a question, sorry, Matt from the ODI again. Um, I had a question about, um, I suppose, interoperability and mm. more specifically, I suppose hypothetically, say DLUC or another public body was using Foundry uh, to create these insights, but then suddenly decided to switch to a different supplier mm. or uh, a different uh, technical infrastructure. Would the assets that had previously been created through Found Foundry still be usable with a different system or would that not be the case? Yeah, that's a great question. So. All of, the, all of the IP and the tools developed on top of Foundry belong to our customers. So all the pipelines written, the models written, they belong to our customers. Great, thanks. Um, let's take a quick one at the back there as well. Yeah. Hartley Miller again. Um, uh, reconciling the objects is one thing, but reconciling the characteristics of the objects and particularly the judgments that are made about situations strikes me as being quite difficult. How do you deal with a situation where different assessments are made about what is suitable for a given um, immigrant and who ultimately decides what the answer is? Yeah, so are we talk if, we're speak if we're speaking specifically to the entity resolution piece about how to reconcile conflicts of information, that's something that is recorded on the platform by the local authority user who may have more information by contacting the folks from the applications. Um, if we're talking about judgments on like safeguarding concerns, that's something that's outlined in policy guidance. Thanks. Um, this may be the final question. Depends how quickly we get through it. Uh, this is from Peter Wells online. Good evening to you, Peter. He says, hello. Um, for various reasons, Palantir isn't trusted by some people. How did the project consider what impact the use of Palantir might have on uptake of the service? For example, whether it might reduce numbers of offers of help. Yep. I think that, firstly, I don't decide who decides to use Foundry, but the second piece is that like, there's a misconception that, and a feeling that we're like an other in the government space, but Palantir has been in the UK for over 10 years. We have over 1,000 people in the London office, and we're common people who walk around or in this, or in this room today, uh, as a matter of fact. So I think there is a feeling of othering from the company, which you know, stems from, like, of, I guess, the, the history of working in very important industries that we're all very proud of to actually support. Um, and yeah, that's, <laughs> that's what I've got. Cool, well, that brings us almost perfectly to time. So Ishrak, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Gavin. And we now go to um, our final present, presenter of the evening. Uh, it's virtual again, we're up to Greater Manchester and we're up to Chris. Good evening, Chris. Can you Hello. Hear? Yes, I can. Hello, everyone. Um, so, yes, um, I think there's some great presentations tonight. Thank you very much. I, th I think there's a bit of a Venn diagram between uh, what I'm going to talk, talk about tonight and uh, what some of the other presenters have, have spoken about. So I want to ask that kind of question of, of how can local data best support levelling up? And well, Liz referenced Stiglitz, and, and I want to reference another noted uh, development economist, Amarja Sen. Uh, he argues that freedom is both a means to and an end of development. And in the same respect, uh, I see better local data as both a means to and an end of levelling up. Better local data needs to be aligned to local priorities. And, and I suppose this is a bit of a, a call to action. Greater Manchester wants a greener, fairer, more prosperous city region. Uh, we need better local data like the Thriving Cities Index, like the Co-op Community Wellbeing Index uh, and others. And we need these to make better decisions to support levelling up. Uh, and not just at the local level. We need better local data to support growth itself. 
Now, I could focus on any number of topics around data to support leveling up. There's, there's many areas we need to improve, and we know that our basic inputs need to be good quality. They need to be timely. They need to be complete. We know that our tools need to be accurate and that, um, that people are trained in using them and understanding them. And we also know that uh, people need to understand our overall communications, our plans of, of what we want to do with information. But to level up, I really think we need to focus more on, on of our efforts on, on some of those basic inputs, particularly better local data. Now, we operate in a world uh, in, in kind of local government in the combined authority, Greater Manchester Combined Authority that I, they're working with, a kind of a continuum of different types of local data from more policy oriented data, which gives a great overview of what's going on. Uh, the ONS's export subnational indicators dashboard, fantastic in that respect, uh, really gives you a lot of detail at the local authority level. But at the combined authority and in local areas, obviously, and, and in central government, we go beyond that and we go to a more nuanced, more strategic data and even down to operational level information, things like apprenticeship starts, planning applications uh, and so on. Um, at the CA, we operate more in that strategic and, and operational space. And to create better local data in that space, I think there's three things that we need to do. First, we need new data. There's so many areas where data are just not captured, where local areas have a role or need that information to help them make better decisions around levelling up. In Greater Manchester, we've looked at some new sources of information, such as uh, web scraping, uh, using keywords, and we've worked with the Data City to, to kind of use this approach uh, to identify some innovating firms and digital businesses. And I think people in the room are probably aware that some of the standard industrial classifications, occupational classifications, perhaps not as good at picking up digital firms, digital businesses, and, and digital employment as, uh, as in other areas. And some of that work's yielded some, some quite interesting, promising results as well. We've also developed a tool and a data set to look at digital exclusion. And, and that's, a, that's a high and growing priority if we are going to level up. We need people online to be able to take advantage of the opportunities, but we also, um, there's opportunities for us there in, in, as a public sector um, in being able to support people who are online as well. But there isn't a single national data set that says, hey, look, here's the people in this area who are digitally excluded. Uh, and that would be immensely helpful if it was available. So we created a digital exclusion risk index uh, to identify um, and use a range of open data, identify where people are more likely to be digitally excluded. We've made it open, we've made it available at lower super output area level, and we've created it for all of Great Britain as well. We've not just done it for Greater Manchester. The second thing we think we need to do is to broaden and deepen our existing data sets, the things that are already out there. And one issue we've always faced is around GVA. And there's always been a clamour for lower level GVA estimates to help with projects, to help understand development, or even just applying for government funding. But there is a contention between whether we should go for a lower geographic level data, and I really appreciate the work that the ONS has done in this, and the ONS local kind of being our, our connection into that about providing data at LSOA level. Um, but is it more important than more timely data? As, as, as someone noted in a Greater Manchester Analyst Network meeting just the other week, it's not really useful knowing that an LSOA was in a recession two years ago. What matters is whether the district is now. And this push for higher frequency and smaller geographies is played out across different data sets. The English Housing Survey, really great product, but designed primarily from a kind of policy oriented focus. And it would be great to get that kind of data at a local authority level. Greater Manchester's economy is bigger than North East England. It's bigger than Wales. It's bigger than Northern Ireland. And I'm not saying that to boast. I'm saying that because there's a need to support those kinds of areas with the right data at the right level. And we've tried deepening some of our data sets and making them more effective. Uh, for example, we've brought together information across Greater Manchester on land and property assets beyond the usual transparency code information. Uh, and this can help users better understand options for co-location or for using land and property assets better. 
And finally, we think we need clearer, more consistent data. One issue for us has been uh, understanding the vast array of government funding that comes into the city region and whether we're, whether or not we're a net contributor to the to the Treasury. And um, Tom brought up some work that's been done uh, in DLUC, which is really fantastic. Looking forward to kind of seeing that in, in more, more detail. But this data is produced by multiple departments in different ways and each has that slightly annoying differences uh you know are, are they writing things down as city of edinburgh or edinburgh comma city of it's little things like that that take the time when you're when you're analyzing the information and kind of just um pushes you to uh, uh to have to do have to spend more time uh on the work so we pulled all of that data together um, across England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and we hopefully made it more clearer and more consistent at a local authority level as well. So showing that tax and spend at local authority level. We've also taken strides in understanding where development's going to occur. So making one standard data schema uh, for, for uh, land supply across 10 local planning authorities. We published it all in one place on a map. Um, and we feel that's not just helpful to us as a public sector to be able to understand that, but we've also seen private sector organisations get involved and, and want to use and see that information. Organisations like real estate agents, like developers. But we've also seen the general public get involved too. And, and it's, it's, it's that sense of, of getting more uh, organisations, more individuals, more members of the public involved that can generate trust and can, uh, can build relationships. And I think that's, I think for me, that's that's the next thing. If we are going to have better local data, we need to think about where we're going to start. There's lots of things to do, certainly. But we need to build new, better, stronger relationships, not just with, but especially with central government. Um, Leveling up isn't all about what funding powers, responsibilities are being used. Local areas also want to access the same information that central government has about their area, because how else are we going to help support better local decision making? But more than that, we need relationships with local partners, with the public, with the private, with the third sector, and we need to understand their needs. We need to understand how the public sector can support that. For example, can we open up more data so that new products, new services uh, can be built and can be delivered? and that we can help to generate new growth. We also need to foster and maintain trust. Trust is at the heart of a lot of things that we do in Greater Manchester. It's the heart of our information strategy as well. We need trust in the quality of our information and trust in how we use that information and trust in the organisations that collect that information as well. And that can help us to identify new data sources. It can help us to capture the right information. Uh, it can also help us to build better relationships. So I think I've definitely gone over there. So better local data for us, I, I think is a means to levelling up and it can help us make better decisions if we have the right data, but it's also an end to levelling up too, as long as kind of along the way we should be levelling up a lot of our local data assets. So thank you. Thank you, Chris. Excellent. Great to see you, Chris. Um, and again, just a reminder to those of you watching us online, use the Slido to put your questions to Chris. And if you're not already on the Slido, it's bit.ly slash Slido DB36. Um, let's go into the room for the first question. Who'd like to ask Chris something? Matt Cole again. Um, thanks. It was really interesting and especially sort of because I've had a background in local government was where I first started working um, and know the pebbles of data in that space. Um, you talk about new data as being like the first of your priorities. If there was one piece of new data to help the pop, sort of help the situation and policy things you're trying to achieve in, in the combined authority, what one, what one piece of data would it be? I have, I work in as part of the research team in the combined authority, so I work alongside a number of kind of policy leads, a number of research leads, and they're all my friends, so I'm not going to say one specific area there. I think there's certainly a lot around housing, there's certainly a lot around uh, GVA, there's certainly a lot from a kind of levelling up perspective around business and innovation. Um, I think one of the areas, though, that we are lacking is inequalities data, is understanding inequalities. 
because the, I think Tom presented a lot of you know interesting stuff from IMD, the um, NC's deprivation affecting children, affecting older people. Um, but what we don't have a handle on, I think, is more uh, more localised data on sex, on gender, on uh, on ethnicities, on disability, uh, on disabled people, and so on. So we, we've got the census data, yes, but I don't think we we have that level of information at the operational or even the strategic level on uh, on inequalities in how pay affects different uh, uh, affects different group oh sorry how uh, different groups are, uh, are paid um there's just so many kind of areas in there and i think as i said before greater manchester cares about a fairer uh, greener and more prosperous city region and that fairer aspect is the one where we know there's just not enough data at the minute and we would like more information so that we can make better informed decisions and it means that we can deliver services um, based on well-informed data and it also means that we're not going to be exacerbating existing biases um, within perhaps some of the services that we deliver or some of the data that we already have. Great, thank you. I suspect that full list of data you'd like would take us a lot longer than eight minutes. Very long. Let's stay in the room for the next question. Um, I'll take uh, the, the very back there and we'll come to you next. Um, thank you very much for your comments and I concur with many of them, especially when you talked about where digitization and technology is. Because if you, if you don't have that, how can you um, form effective policy? Um, but I'd like if you could uh, elaborate a little on keywords, because keywords have a, a cultural impact. So if you're using keywords, you might actually, um, when you're cleaning up the data, be using the wrong data, because they could have a, a set of meanings. But I'd like to um, um, land with this, that you know, intersectionality of data and um, analyzing it is very important, because it has an impact on the opportunities the relationships, the progression, and the resources. And if you can impact all of that, um, you can actually create growth um, in, in a community. And all of that is based on culture. So I come back to my point, intersectionality of ideas, of people, and which I think is very important in analyzing the data, clearing the data, analyzing it, and using, determine what model you're going to use for policy. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Um, on keywords, yes, uh, I completely agree. I, um, I think we we use the data city um, and kind of that approach to understand um, for our uh, local industrial strategy several years ago uh, to try to understand some of the businesses that are there. And and uh, we we I think one of the things that came we came out with was that uh, in Greater Manchester there is a um, a kind of a, a strong core of businesses uh, dealing with heavy metal. Now, we have no idea whether they mean heavy metal, the music, or heavy metal as in heavy metals. So I completely understand the kind of the, the point around keywords. However, I think that approach in particular, we try to use on, um, we try to use to understand uh, sectors that were not traditionally or not easily represented within uh, standard industrial classifications and we use the engagement with businesses to identify the best keywords to be using and that's not the only approach it's not going to be the only data that we use but it is a part of our um our, our work and on intersectionality uh, yes completely agree i mentioned the information strategy in greater manchester and, and one of the key points around that is that we have um, a very inclusive governance and we have a uh, a more open um, relationship with the public uh, try to hear as many voices and include as many voices uh, there's a consultation out now on the delivery plan for the information strategy we want to hear as many voices on that as possible um, and uh, you know it's right i said trust is at the heart of what we do and what we try to do and it has to be because as i said before if we don't have trust we don't get engagement then we're not capturing the right information about our residents around businesses we're not delivering the right services and we're potentially um, exacerbating biases and that is not what we want because that's going to lead to even less engagement and less trust uh, so yeah I, I 
I agree with you on that point, yes, certainly. Great, thank you. Uh, we had a question there and I'll come to you next. Simon, Simon Briscoe. Um, the traffic is a big problem for most cities and I just wondered whether you'd try to do any partnerships with DVLA or police or parking providers to use registration plates to track who's coming into the city and how people are moving around the city. Uh, that's the first part of your final slide. The second bit about trust is, uh, I believe DLUP is doing honest, decent work, but when I look at local authorities around London, there are some that are using this sort of traffic data to try and understand what's going on, and there are others, like my own as it happens, that won't try to collect this data, I think, because they think the data won't support the policies they're pursuing. So I just wondered where along that spectrum you think Manchester is of, of being an honest, trustworthy collector of data to drive policy as opposed to the other way around? Uh, I can't speak, unfortunately, to 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 the the use of uh, of uh, vehicle number plate recognition. I, I can't speak to that because uh, that's very much the perfume of uh, transport for Greater Manchester, certainly. Um, but yes, uh, uh, trust has to be, as I said, at the heart of it because then we need to because we need to be able to explain how and why we are going to be using information. If we do, I can't. Like I say, uh, speak for whether or not we we're going any doing any further work with DVLA. Um, but if we do, we need to be able to explain that and explain that in a sensible and a consistent way that everyone's going to understand, not just a kind of you need to read this big long document that explains how we're working with X organisation on tracking you. That's not the best way of working, and that's definitely not going to uh, generate further trust. So we we have to be open about not just the information that we're collecting, but what we're doing with it, the openness around analysis, not just openness around data, um, but also openness around processes and decision-making processes as well, especially an example like that where we might be using automatic decision-making. Um, we're, we're looking at what we can do around it, and I think we've, we've, we're trying to work with other organisations, learn from other areas uh, like TfL, uh, like London, who have perhaps done stuff in this area before. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll always come back to, we need to ensure that trust is the basis that we work on and we should foster and maintain further trust with, uh, with our residents. Great, if we can keep the question and the answer short, I am gonna get your question in very quickly. Uh, sorry if you can hear me. Uh, hi, Mazen Abdelhamoud from Palantir. Um, so you touched upon biases within data and I'm, I come from necessarily from an area where I've seen firsthand the negative repercussions that biases within data have on, for example, local government efforts to, as you say, level up in these impoverished areas, right? Um, I think like a clear example we can think of is back during the pandemic when um, local schools were, um, well, kids coming out of college were given predicted A-level grades and you saw the biases in data of impoverished areas where these moving averages were much lower than, say, richer areas and these kids were just completely you know demoralized by the fact that they were given grades that just were not reflective of their actual capabilities how do you then mitigate you know alongside their inequality measures how do you mitigate these biases within the data such that these negative repercussions are kind of minimized within the future that's a big question uh, I, th I think part of it is um, part of it is ensuring that you're kind of your kind of training models, whatever you're using as your kind of as your base data, is kind of as as free of bias as you possibly can make it. But I recognise there's always going to be a bias. But then there also needs to be an inclusion inclusion in kind of a wider governance and ensuring that the governance of those processes and the explanation of those processes happens in advance rather than just a kind of yeah we're doing it now and here's your result, uh, here's the number at the other end. Um, on that particular point, um, on the on the uh, DFE uh, issue, I think our our approach to that is more around ensuring that we have a consistent and well explained process of what we're doing, 
how the calculation comes about. Uh, so it's not just information going into a black box and then kind of some figure coming out at the other end, that there's some explanation around that. And we're, we're looking with, um, with some of our partners about whether or not there should be um, consultation principles when we're thinking about using automatic decision making or when we're thinking about using AI, uh, how we should put that in place and who should be engaged within that, preferably everyone. Um, but we recognise that not everyone's going to be actively engaged in that, so we do need to do a lot of, uh, of more active engagement externally as well. Chris, that's been fantastic. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Some very quick parish notices before I let those of you in the room uh, get some food and drink. I'm assuming everybody watching us online is already well into the mulled wine and mince pies. Um, the first is that the video of this event will be available on the IFG website uh, over the next couple of days, so do check it out there. Uh, the next Data Bytes, also kindly supported by Palantir, will, is currently scheduled to be Thursday the 2nd of February. Um, as I said, do keep an eye on the IFG website. We might even squeeze something in in January, so uh, keep Keep an eye on that. Um, lots of IFG events coming up uh, over the next few weeks as well on House of Lords reform and national resilience. We'll also be publishing um, very soon um, some outputs from our project on data sharing in government during the pandemic. So the first of those papers hopefully coming out in the next day or so. So again, keep an eye on the IFG website. All that remains for me to say um, are three very big thanks, thank yous. First of all, to all of you in the audience uh, and online as well, some great questions tonight. Uh, a huge thank you to Palantir for supporting tonight's event and making it possible. And please do join me in a huge round of applause and thank you for our brilliant speakers this evening. Thank you very much indeed. <laughs>